So this word worship, this is a word that gets thrown around for a lot of different terms. Yeah, it, it's obviously, it's a, a genre of music. We just did it here in the service, you know, before uh, Kyle came out here. But we tend to use this word, we tend to overuse it. So we use it to kind of signify or apply to a lot of different things, you know. There's poetry, like, uh, I'll worship the ground that you walk on, you know. Guys, if you've said that to any ladies, you know. Uh, but the point is, we use it for a lot of stuff. We worship this, we worship that, we sing praise and worship. But we got to be careful, because that is not exactly what the word means. Or We're using the word in an area where the meaning of the word is not reflective of the way that we're using the word. And so I want to first make sure we're all clear on the actual definition of worship. So worship is not a genre of music. Instead, it's this act of showing profound reverence. Reverence is like respect. But I like that the word, this is not a dictionary out of the Bible. This uh, This is a dictionary entry here. This is what the world sees as worship. This is where it, it, what it means and where it comes from. So, showing profound reverence, honor, adoration, or devotion to a deity. That word deity is, is going to be important. To a deity, a divine being, or sacred objects. It can involve both internal attitudes and external expressions. Now that we've talked about this definition, now that I've read this for you, there's probably some things that you are worshiping that you did not know that you were worshiping. So what, what could be in your life that you are showing profound reverence, honor, adoration, or devotion to as kind of like a deity, as a god, a divine being, a sacred object? Because it involves both internal and external expressions and attitudes. So what that means is that this internal, external thing, that's all of you. So worship happens externally through things that you do, through raising your hands in music, through singing praise and worship. It happens uh, if you're worshiping the ground that your wife or your partner walks on, then that's the flowers, you know, the external, hey, I'm giving you flowers. But internally, there's an attitude of the heart where you're saying, okay, I have this emotion of adoration, this emotion of reverence and honor. And and so it's, it's all of you. Worship is all of you being applied to or ascribing value to something else. So it requires all of you, inside and outside. Now, God is pretty strict on worship. If you're new here, if you don't know anything about the Bible, let me just tell you that the big guy in the sky is pretty strict about who we as Christ followers say or practice in our worship. He's very strict about it. But here's a question. Why do you think God is so strict that we only worship Him? Why, why would that be? See, the definition is that worship is applied to a deity, to a sacred object. And so when we worship something else, even though my wife sitting down here on the front row is very much amazing and beautiful and she is worthy of worship... Yeah, <laughs> she's looking at me like, you know, I almost said a bad word. So <clears throat> even, even though th- th- that applies, like when, when I apply worship to something, I'm giving it deity status. I'm giving it God tier status, S tier status for the, the Internet culture in here. And God doesn't want us to do that. That's why he's so strict. He's like, no, no, no. Worship only comes to me. So let's look at Exodus 20, 3 through 5 here. God just lays it out pretty plain and simple here. And he says, he's talking to the Israelites. But let's pretend he's talking, to, well, he is talking to us as well. You shall have no other gods before me. So God is telling them, nah, nothing else should come before me. You shall not make for yourself any idol or any likeness or form or manifestation. So you're not to create a, a trinket or an altar or an idol or a carving or whatever, it, whatever that could be in your life. I know the Israelites created golden calves and all kinds of things out of jewelry. And he says, don't create any likeness of what is in heaven above or on earth beneath or in the water under the earth as an object of worship. God's like, let me just make this easy for you. 
everything, don't create anything out of everything as an object of worship. It goes from heaven to the depths of the ocean. So that way we can't say, well, this thing I found in a cave, and so I can worship that thing. Or this thing I found, you know, under the ocean somewhere, or, you know, and, and so now I'm going to worship that. God's like, nothing can apply, nothing can be worshipped. And he goes on in verse 5 here. And he says, and this, I love this verse here. He says, you shall not worship them nor serve them, for I, the Lord, your God, am a jealous, which means impassioned God, demanding what is rightfully and uniquely mine. Now, you could read this like a two-year-old, okay? So if God is a two-year-old, then it's, th- this is a jealous God that needs to learn how to share. And I think... You know, sadly, a lot of people, I saw, saw some laughter, which is great. A lot of people think that God is a, is a two-year-old. He's a jealous God. Why doesn't he share? Well, why, why is God saying like, hey, I'm jealous. I thought jealousy was a sin. I thought we weren't supposed to be jealous. But it's, it's impassioned. And, and why is God demanding it rightfully and uniquely that, that we're his? Okay, that, that could sound negative. It could sound controlling. Some of us don't like to be, you know, controlled. But what's really happening here, I want you to get this. What's happening here is God is saying that I made you. You came from me. And so, yes, I have a unique, uh, you're you're mine. You're uniquely mine. You know, our children, they are uniquely ours. You know, whether you made your kids or not, those that are in your home... You, they are uniquely yours. So God is saying, hey, you're, you're mine because you're made in my image. And then God is also saying, this jealousy part, God is saying, can I just be enough for you? Can it just be me? Can we just do this to where you don't share your worship with something else? You know, worship broken down, worship, ascribing or adding value to something. God is saying, just let it be me. Because I made you. And I know you better than anybody or anything else. So just be okay with it just being me. See, God wants all of our worship and God wants all of you. He wants all of me. He doesn't want part. And so if you think about God as the creator... As the one that sent Jesus to die for our sins, to open up and and allow us to join him in heaven and have just grace and mercy applied to us. That guy, that God is saying, I want all of you. I I would like to, for me, that makes me feel really secure. It makes me feel great that there's a heavenly father that just wants all of me. And he wants me to be okay with just only him. You know what? God is enough for my life. He's more than enough for my life. I'm so thankful for Him and who He is for me. I'm happy to give Him all of me or to try every day to give Him more of me. But that's what this is right here. God just wants to be enough for you. He he just wants to be enough. And as I was preparing this message, I've got two things that I'm afraid of. it's, it's It's not spiders or the dark. But two things that I'm afraid of uh, for you guys. And I, I don't generally preach out of fear. But I'm afraid for you guys that there may be a misinterpretation of worship. Which means that you're going to miss out on a whole bunch of really good stuff. And so we're going to talk about those two fears that I have for you. The first one is that everyone worships something. Everyone worships something. If, you're not a, if you don't believe in God... Or if you're you know, agnostic, you, there's something that you're ascribing value to, value and adoration and honor to. Everyone worships something, but here's the thing. What if it's the wrong thing? What, that, that, that's where I, as Pastor Chris, when I prepare these messages and I stand here and I think about, why does this matter to you? It doesn't matter because I'm up here and I'm saying it. It doesn't matter because it's church. It doesn't matter because it's a Jesus thing or because you walked in the doors right here. It matters because you could be thinking that you're worshiping the right thing when you're actually worshiping the wrong thing. And and I'm not okay with that. That unsettles my spirit because I want us to be worshiping the right thing. And so we're going to explain what 
the right thing is. In Luke, so here's, the best way to explain this is through uh, the Gospel of Luke. There's this kind of unique thing that's in the New Testament. There's Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Four Gospels. And in those four Gospels, there's a story, uh, which is an actual event. When I say the word story, it's an event that happened. And in this event, as this event is told, it has a few common characteristics. And so first we're going to look at Luke, because it's talking about a woman. And then we're going to look at Matthew, Mark, and John, because th- then that one, a different woman is getting talked about three different times. So what's happening in Luke is Jesus is invited over to have dinner with Pharisees. Pharisees were the pro Christians. They, they had like the upgraded package. They knew everything that there was to know about the laws. In fact, they even like set their own laws. So the Pharisees who hated Jesus have a dinner, which is actually more like a banquet. And they invite Jesus. Jesus shows up as he would. And at this banquet, they would be sitting, reclining at a table. All right, so I want you guys to think about Jesus, you know, sitting at a table. His feet would be pointed away from the table. And it's a, obviously a low table. And they would be lounging on one arm. And then with the other hand is what they would, they would eat with. And so Jesus is there, surrounded by the Pharisees. A banquet, a lot of people around. And he's munching. He's having some snacks. They probably got the game, you know, up over the bar there. There's a lot going on there, you know. And so Jesus is there. And all of a sudden, as the scripture tells us this, from behind Jesus comes walking a woman. I like to think that, you know, she, she shouldn't be there in no way, form, or fashion. Nor should she ever approach a Pharisee or Jesus because she was known to be a sinner. There's a misinterpretation is that she was an adulteress. But actually, that's not what it says. It just says that she was a known sinner. So she's unclean. She wouldn't be allowed at this dinner. If she were to touch a Pharisee, it would make them unclean. So this is, she, there's a big no-no here. And she creeps up behind Jesus. And Jesus' feet, which are away from the table, start to get wet. Because she's crying. And her tears are coming out. See, this known sinner heard that Jesus was in town. And she was desperate enough that she went and found where he was and went into a home that she should never have been in. And she cries on Jesus' feet. And then she uses her hair to wipe that. And she has this jar, this very beautiful jar, which would have a very expensive perfume in it. And she breaks it open and she puts it on him. And so there's this incredible moment that's happening in her. But there's not an incredible moment that's happening in the Pharisees or those that are watching her. In fact, they look at Jesus in this moment and they say, what kind of a prophet are you? That you're letting her do this to you. She shouldn't even be on your feet. She shouldn't be touching you. She was actually even kissing his feet. Which is like an extreme sign of of honor. Of adoration. She was worshiping Jesus. And Jesus hears that she's getting criticized. And so he says, Simon, which is the name of the Pharisee. Simon, can I tell you something that's what it says in the, the New King James and the Amplified. Can I tell you something? And Simon says, sure. What's up, man? That's not in the Bible. But he says, yes. All right. And so Jesus says, there's a debtor. There's two people that are in debt. And there's a master. And one of them is in debt 500 rand. And one of them is in debt 5 million rand. You know, the rand is in the, the New Testament. It's in the Bible. And then Jesus says... The master forgives them both their debt. Wiped clean. Jesus, I received that. Wiped clean. And then he asked Simon, which one do you think loves the master more? Simon, I mean, it's not a trick question here. He says, well, the one who had the biggest debt. And that's where Jesus begins to teach here. In verse 44, Jesus then says uh, to Simon, he says, he, he, well, He turns towards the woman who's been down there. She's not said anything up to this point at all. She's been at Jesus' feet. And Jesus turns to the woman. And he says to Simon, while he's looking at the woman, he says, Simon, who's over here, do you see 
this woman? Do you see her? And then Jesus says, I came into your house, Simon, but you failed to extend to me the usual courtesies shown to a guest. But look at what she has done. In verse 44, it goes on to say, But she has wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair, demonstrating her love. See, it was, a, it was a custom that when you visited someone's home, you came for dinner or for a banquet, there would be water there to wash your feet, wash the dust off your feet. And Simon, the Pharisee, the one that knew all the laws, had not offered that to Jesus because there wasn't a respect there. But out of adoration, look at what this woman does here. Jesus then goes on to compare a few things so that Simon can learn a lesson. In verse 45, Jesus goes on to say, You gave me no welcoming kiss, Simon, but look at this woman. Do you see this woman? This woman, from the moment I came in, she has not ceased to kiss my feet. In verse 46, You did not even anoint my head with ordinary oil, but she has anointed my feet with costly and rare perfume. And then verse 47, Jesus says, Therefore I say to you, her sins, which are many. So which which, which debt, which which person that's in debt loves the master more? The one with the greatest debt? And Jesus says, she's got the biggest debt in the room, maybe. But her sins are many, but they're forgiven. For she loved much. But he who is forgiven little, loves little. Then he said to her, your sins... Are forgiven. See, there's something significant here. Is where there's worship, there's forgiveness. Where there's worship, there's salvation. Where there's worship, your sins are wiped away. In verse 49 here, it says, Those who were reclining at the table with him began to say among themselves, Who is this who even forgives sins? They're questioning Jesus. Who can actually forgive sins? Jesus says to the woman, your faith in me has saved you. So he's not worried about what they're saying. They're going to chatter, you know. You got people that chatter in your life? Well, you can just let them chatter somewhere else. Because Jesus, looking at her, your faith in me has saved you. Go in peace, free from the distress experienced because of sin. See, where there's worship, there's also peace. Where there's worship, there's forgiveness. Where there's worship... There's peace. Do you want forgiveness? Do you want peace in your life? Well, maybe we need to learn how to worship. We need to learn who to worship. In fact, you know, this goes back to my fear of we may be worshiping the wrong thing. Because here we have two different kinds of worship that are happening. You've got the woman who's a known sinner. She's worshiping. And you've got Simon, a respected Pharisee. He's worshiping. She is worshiping Jesus. But Simon, the Pharisee, thinks that he's worshiping God because he's keeping the laws and these commandments. But Simon's worshiping the wrong thing. Now, how do you know if you're worshiping the right thing or the wrong thing? Well, you can look at fruit. We did a series on fruit. So you could see, do I have the fruit of forgiveness in my life? Or do I have the fruit of judgment in my life? See, she worshiped and was forgiven. And therefore, when you are forgiven much, you're able to forgive much. When you are loved much, you're able to forgive much. But Simon, the Pharisee, he was judged. Not only was he judged by Jesus, but Simon was judging this woman. See, I I don't want us to think that we're worshiping the right thing. But actually, we're worshiping the wrong thing. I don't want to leave anybody panicked. Or anybody second-guessing, well, am I, am I doing it wrong? You know, I'm raising both hands when I worship. Is that right? Or should I, is it only the left hand during the chorus and the right hand during the verse? And, you know, if I don't read my Bible every day, then I'm not, you know, worshiping God. And, you know, I've not memorized any scripture. Or, you know, I, I kind of really like, you know, some stuff that's on Netflix. It's not like, eh, super great, you know, but it's a really good story, you know. Does that mean I'm not worshiping? I don't, it's not about that. What it's about is what's happening in your heart and then what's happening externally. You know, externally, uh, what this woman was doing was just coming to the feet of Jesus, bawling her eyes out. She didn't say the right thing or even anything. What's happening in her heart is she realizes that Jesus is in town and she needs to go meet with him. So if you look in your life, I would like more forgiveness because I'm experiencing too much judgment, then 
maybe you're worshiping the wrong thing. And if you're worshiping the wrong thing, it doesn't make you a bad person. I just feel like right now I need to clarify this, probably because I'm a mind reader and some of you are thinking this right now. If you're worshiping the wrong thing, you're not a bad person at all. Christ loves you. God loves you. And it's more or less just let's learn how to worship the right thing. So you, you, you may not know how to do that. And that's okay. Keep coming back. Let's learn. Let's talk. Let's figure out how to do that together. Now, i, I got to move on. So uh, the second fear that I have for you guys, second thing that I'm worried about. So the first thing was you could be worshiping the wrong thing. Now, the second is this. It, it's hard to worship. While our hurt and pain is so great. Are you in pain? Are you hurting? Is life got you down? Is it your circumstances, your situations? And what, what, what's happening right now in your life? If you're in pain, if you're hurting, we've all been there. I've been there. It's really, really, really hard to worship while life's falling apart. While sickness isn't healed. While finances aren't coming through. While the miracle that you're praying for isn't happening. While family is tearing you down. While your friends are abandoning you. While you've lost the job. While the car is broken down. It's really hard to have a worshipful heart in that moment. Really difficult, you know. And in fact, this is why I'm so worried. Is what if worship in spite of your hurt and pain has the ability to heal you? Because you could stay in the hurt and pain and hope life changes. But I believe that worship, in spite of the hurt and pain, actually has the ability to heal you. Now I want to talk about another woman, similar circumstance. And this one we find in Matthew and in Mark and in Luke. And we're actually going to read all three. They're not super long. But we're going to go quickly through Matthew and Mark because they're kind of a retelling of the both. Uh, of the same thing. We're going to do both of these because half of you don't pay attention, so you're going to gloss over Matthew, right? And then I'll get you in Mark, okay? So that's how we're going to do that there. Okay, so let's, let's, let's look at what's happening here. All right, in Matthew 26, he's talking about a woman here. So now when Jesus was back in Bethany, Bethany's right outside of Jerusalem. This is about six days before Jesus is put on the cross and before he dies. So while Jesus is back there at Bethany, and he uses the word back because he had been there previously. We'll find out about that in John. So he's back at Bethany at the home of Simon the leper. And here's what's in, So this has nothing to do with the sermon, but what's so interesting here, Simon the leper means that he was someone that had leprosy. Someone that has leprosy doesn't have a home. They're outside the city gates. Someone that has leprosy would not have someone else in their home. So Jesus, who's in the home of Simon the leper, who is a friend of his, most likely was a leper that was healed by Jesus. And that's cool, right? So Jesus is in Simon, who had leprosy, who was healed by Christ. And a woman, here's another woman. A woman comes to him, and she has an alabaster vial, which is a very, very expensive jar. And inside this alabaster vial, a very, there's a very expensive perfume. And she poured it on Jesus' head as he reclined at the table. So he's got his elbows out. He's eating banquet-style meal. And she comes in. She breaks it. She pours it on him. But when the disciples say, saw this, when they saw, they were indignant and angry. Indignant's a bad word. That does just sound horrible. They were indignant and angry, saying, Why all the waste of money? For this perfume might have been sold at a high price, and the money given to the poor, right? Self-righteous, like, come on, you know, look at us. We're so righteous here. You know, we could have given this over to the poor. But Jesus steps in, as he knows that his disciples are, uh, they need coaching. They need some work. And so in verse 10, Jesus says to them, as he's aware of the malice of his remark. And he says, why are you bothering the woman? It's like, guys, what are you doing? I say this to my two-year-old and five-year-old all the time. Like, Benjamin, why are you bothering Wyatt? You know, Wyatt, why are you bothering your brother? Why are you guys bothering this person? She has done a good thing for me. So you think it was a waste, but she's actually done something good. For you always have the poor with you, but you will not always have me. 
When she poured this perfume on my body, she did it to prepare me for my burial. Because in six days, Jesus is going to die. In verse 13, closing this out, I assure you and most solemnly say to you, wherever the gospel of salvation is preached in the whole world, what this woman has done will also be told in memory of her for her act of love and devotion. You know, when I read this right here, I tried to kind of read between the lines a little bit. Because what it sounds like is wherever the gospel message, this gospel message is that Jesus came, died on the cross, rose again three days later, and we're given mercy and grace, and we're given forgiveness of our sins. That's the gospel message, the good news. And wherever that message is preached... Maybe it's not so much that this woman will be remembered and honored, but maybe instead it's her worship will be remembered and honored. Because wherever there is salvation, worship will follow. And this woman had received salvation. And she had experienced that and she came to worship Jesus at His feet. In Mark 14, same story. Okay, So now those of you... Tune back in. If you tuned in for Matthew, you can tune out for Mark. You can swap, okay? So while he was at Bethany, sounds pretty familiar, as a guest at the home of their Simon the leper and reclining at a table, a woman comes up with an alabaster vial of very costly and precious perfume of pure nard. And she broke the vial, okay, and poured the perfume over his head. Verse 4, this goes on, but there were some who were indignantly, there's that word again, this is a bad word, remarking to one another, why has this perfume been wasted? For this might have gone and been sold for more than 300 denarii, which is like a a year's worth of, of wages. And the money could have been given to the poor. And then they, they scolded her. That's another horrible word. I can't believe that. But then Jesus says to them, he says, okay, you guys are out of control here. So in the next verse, in verse 8, Jesus says, Let her alone. Why are you bothering her and causing trouble? She has done a good thing, a beautiful thing to me. For you always have the poor with you, and wherever you wish, and, and wherever you wish, you can do something good to them. But you will not always have me. You will not always have me. So Jesus is arranging their priorities here. And then in verse 8, as this one closes out, she's done what she could. She's anointed my body beforehand of my burial. I assure you and most solemnly say to you, the good news of salvation, so where there's salvation, wherever that's proclaimed through the world, where she has done in memory of her will go with that. So there's the same story in Matthew and Mark. Now we're going to pick the same story up in John. But in John, it gets personal. In Matthew and Mark, uh, all the names and faces have been protected, you know, for the telling of the story. But in John, John gives it and he tells who's there. So watch what happens now. This is so cool, the way that this works out. It's so cool what Jesus does here. It's so cool to see how this worship thing happens here. So let's jump in here to John. And John is in chronological order mostly, and so it tells us this story um, in, in order if you read the book of John. So John chapter 12 here. Six days before the Passover. There's our six. See, it's not that I'm a Bible scholar. I can just read, all right? Six days before the Passover, Jesus goes to Bethany. Remember, he went back to Bethany. Why was he in Bethany before? He's in Bethany before because that's where Lazarus was. So Jesus goes back to where Lazarus was, whom he'd raised from the dead. That was a pretty significant moment. So he raises him, and then he goes back there, and now he's in Bethany with Lazarus. So they gave a supper for him there. Okay, so now we've got Simon the leper, who was healed by Jesus. We've got Lazarus, who was brought back from the dead by Jesus. This is like an all-star dinner here. It's like an all-star banquet. So they gave a supper for him. Now Martha was serving, and she, as, as she does if you study her in the Bible... And Lazarus was one of those reclining at the table with him. Now then, the next verse. See, the way that this worked in Matthew and Mark was then a woman. But in John it says, then Mary. So this is Mary of Bethany. Then Mary. Now we have a name. Now we know who this is. Then Mary took a pound of very expensive perfume. That's about three liters. 
She takes a pound of this perfume, this nard, and she pours it on the feet of Jesus. And she wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. How good do you think worship smells? You know? And that, you know? I, in her act of worship, breaking that perfume over Jesus, the house was filled with the smell of worship. You know, your, your smell, your sense of smell is the most powerful sense that you have. And it's the fastest and the strongest sense to associate a smell with an event or with a person. That's why some of you, when you smell certain perfume, you think of your ex-girlfriend. Yeah? Don't say that out loud. None of my exes wore perfume, so I only think of Kate. Yeah. She's again saying, go on. But worship in that home smelled good. And wherever that perfume comes back, Whenever that smell comes back, they're going to know. They're going to remember that moment there. So it's Mary. It's not a woman. Not a random woman. It's Mary, who is the sister of Lazarus, who watched Jesus heal Lazarus. She's the one that comes to worship. She's the one that breaks the jar. She's the one that people were scolding and and calling her indignant. See, in... Matthew and Mark, it just says that they were scolding her. But in John, we get a name. Guess who it is? In verse 4, it says, Judas Iscariot, the one who would betray Jesus, one of his disciples, the one going to betray him, he's the one that says this stuff to her. Why was this perfume not sold for 300 denarii and the money given to the poor? Seems like Judas is trying to worship the right thing, but actually he's worshiping the wrong thing. Then it goes on and and it explains. Now he said this, not because he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief. And since he had the money box, because he was the treasurer, he used to pilfer what was put into it. And so Jesus looks at this woman, who's Mary, looks at the crowd, and he says, hey, let her alone. See, now, now that you have a little context as to who's there, and what the names are. When you go back and look at Matthew and Mark. And you combine that in with John. It starts to paint a whole picture. And so Jesus looks at Mary. The sister of Lazarus. After Judas his disciple has criticized her. And Jesus says let her alone. So that she may keep the rest of it. For the day of my burial. See what's going to happen when Jesus dies. Mary is going to go to cover Jesus with oil and perfume so that he doesn't smell. Guess what she uses? This perfume. So guess where worship goes? It goes from the home to the grave. Only Jesus is no longer in the grave. And in verse 8, Jesus says, You will always have the poor with you, but you're not always going to have me. See, Mary was worshiping Jesus both in heart and in physical action. But Mary was getting criticized heavily for this. See, it's hard to understand where someone's coming from when they worship. And in fact, we often, like the disciples did, we may judge somebody in their worship. But let me just give you some advice, like Jesus was giving his disciples advice. Don't don't judge someone else's worship until you understand their warfare. Don't judge somebody until you know the battle that they've been through. Don't judge somebody until you know what they are at war with. And also, don't be afraid of being judged because nobody understands your warfare. Nobody understands your battle. In fact, if you take uh, John chapter 12, Mary, this is the one that worships Jesus. And we go back a chapter in John because it's in chronological order. Guess what happens? Lazarus dies. And word is sent to Jesus. And Jesus doesn't show up for four days. And when Jesus finally shows up, first Martha runs out to Jesus. And she greets him and she says, where were you? You could have healed him. You could have kept him from dying. And Jesus tells her, you know, hey, I'm going to raise him. This is the plan. I have a purpose in this. Can you trust me? And she's like, okay, it's fine. Then they call Mary to come over. And Mary comes over. And Jesus greets Mary. And Jesus tells uh, Mary, 
that, hey, I've got a purpose, I've got a plan for this. But Mary looks at Jesus, and she's unable to worship him because of the hurt and the pain. In fact, she says to Jesus, she says, where were you? Why weren't you there? Why didn't you heal? Why didn't you save him? See, when Mary came to the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet. That's the first time she fell at his feet. The next time she would fall at his feet, it would be in worship. But now she's fallen at Jesus' feet in judgment and hurt and pain and anger. She falls at his feet and she says, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. And it's through what she says, not Martha, that Jesus is moved to tears. And he is angry at death. He gets mad at death because Mary doesn't come in worship. Mary comes with this raw heart. Where were you? I'm hurt and I'm, I'm full of pain and I'm full of anger. And no, I don't have worship for you. Where were you? Why didn't you save him? And Jesus is so moved by Mary's heart that he goes and he cries. And then he raises Lazarus from the tomb. See, then when you go back to John 12, and we go back to Mary, a woman who walked in and came to Jesus' feet, now not in hurt or pain and anger, but in worship. And when she comes to his feet in worship, just like we've said, you know, over three different books, what does she do? She breaks the jar. She pours the, the perfume on him. And see, that jar, that perfume, was everything for her. The definition of worship is, is it's everything. God wants all of you, and God, God wants you to only want Him, but God wants it all from you. And see, this perfume that Mary had, what that was is that was the dowry for when she got married. That was her life savings. That was her retirement plan. That was the, the thing that was going to be sold that would take care of all her future expenses, all her future, you know, it would provide financial security for her future. And when Mary comes back to the feet of Jesus and she breaks that jar, she says, I'm giving it all to you, Jesus, because I'm giving my future security. I'm giving the future hope of marriage. I'm giving away the thing that, that is going to provide for me into my old age. I'm not thinking about tomorrow, the next day, the next month, the next year. I'm thinking about this moment right here with you, Christ. And she breaks her future open and she pours it on this man in worship. God wants all of you and he wants all of your worship. And it is a safe and good place for you to put it. And so today whether you've been worshiping the wrong thing or whether you've been hurt and there's so much pain in your heart there's so much misunderstanding you don't know why things are happening the way that they are you just you feel it you know you wake up and it's there it's heavy and you just don't have it in you to worship today I want you to to know that it's time to break your jar. It's time for you to break your jar. It's time for you to say, okay, Jesus, I give you my tomorrow. I give you my security. I give you all of me. I give you everything of value to me, but I'm going to break my jar and I'm going to worship you. And when you do that, then you receive as Jesus told, as we heard in Luke, the woman that was healed, Jesus says, your sins are forgiven. Now go in peace. Break your jar. Give it to God. Worship. Because then you're going to go in peace. So it's peace that I offer you today. And when we ask you guys to consider these things, kind of what I'm asking you to consider today, it's all about trust. It's all about trust. I'm saying that at, at some point in your life, at some point in all of our lives, we have to transfer our trust. So we've put our trust in something, worshiping the wrong thing ourselves because we hurt, because of pain. And you've got to transfer that trust away from what you think is going to bring you security. And instead, because the alabaster jar was designed for security. And you've got to transfer from from what you think is going to bring you security and instead you have to put it into what Jesus did which is worthy 
of worship. Jesus healed, healed the lame. He cast out the demons. He healed the blind. Jesus forgave sin. Jesus brought peace where there was no peace. Jesus forgave the past. And he brought you into a righteous and a new presence. Jesus has grace for you, which is to love you in spite of what you've done. Jesus has mercy for you, which is to not punish you for what you deserve. That's Jesus. I think that's a pretty good place for you to give all of you and break your jar today. So I, I want to lead us in a prayer. Um, and we want to give an opportunity for this every single Sunday. And the reason that we do this is because I don't know what God's doing in your heart right now. I don't know everyone that's here. And I don't know what God's doing. So just in case there's somebody here today, maybe, just in case, there's somebody that's heard something about this Jesus guy and you think, well, I've never given Jesus the jar. I've never even given Jesus my life. Hey, you're in a great place. You can walk right into the banquet hall and get right at the feet of Jesus, not have to say anything, and Jesus is going to forgive you and bring you that peace. And so I, I want to lead you in a prayer. And this is just a, a prayer of salvation. It's not the words that get you into heaven. It's the heart. But these are words that can help guide you. And so let's bow our heads and close our eyes. And if you just feel God has been speaking to you this morning about this, then you can pray this in your spirit. Pray this in your head. If you don't understand spirit, just think it inside your brain here. Dear Heavenly Father, I know that I am a sinner. I know my sin should separate me from you forever. I believe your son Jesus died for me. I accept his death as payment for my sin. Thank you for loving me and for giving the gift of Jesus so I could live with you in heaven. Come into my life and be my Savior and friend. In Jesus' name, amen.